But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. Time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is simply 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's bow our heads together for a few moments. And We're in a very powerful chapter of the Bible. Ephesians is one of my favorite books just to read. If you have a King James Bible, it's uh, almost poetic. It's a beautiful literary book. But it is also jam-packed full of doctrine. And we're looking at a doctrine right now based on one word, pistis. It appears in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. It is in the context of seven different doctrines which are the believer's legacy or heritage. And so I want to start at verse 4, and I'll remind you of the section that we're in. There is one body, and we are forming the body of Christ right now in our particular dispensation. We have been inserted into human history in the church age, and we are here for a distinct purpose. God the Father intercalated the church age to form a new royal family to complement Jesus Christ, third royal patent as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So <clears throat> we are here for purpose. And when the body is completed, we will be out of here. And there's, on, there's only going to be one last person to enter the body of Christ. And when that person goes in, the, the rapture, the exit resurrection will occur. Now I want to stop and tell you, you can either believe this or not. And if you don't believe it, your life is going to be different than if you do believe it. And the Bible says it. It says that some people will uh, have great joy when they hear the trumpet call of God and the voice of the archangel. It says, first the dead in Christ shall rise, then we are who are alive and remain shall be caught up, it says, harpazo, the exit resurrection. And some will say, thank, thank God it's the Lord and He's back for us. And some will shrink back in shame. See, though we're studying faith right now is what I'm getting at. Those who live a life of faith will hear the trumpet call of God and the voice of an archangel and they'll be delighted. And those who are not living a life of faith will shrink back and say, I messed around and missed out. And since 60, over 60% 60 of Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled, and the rapture is Bible prophecy. See, what I'm trying to convince you this morning is the fact that you need to be living a life of faith so that when the other 40% of Bible prophecy is fulfilled, you'll say, I lived my life around the Bible and the fact that all these things were going to come true, and I'm so glad of it. But you can live your life with human viewpoint, and you can try to acquire wealth and happiness and prosperity by human means. And when you hear the trump, trump of God and the voice of the archangel, you'll probably miss out on, a, on a, quite a bit of blessing. So there's one body, and it's being formed right now. And you're, if you're a believer, you're in the body of Christ. And you're about to go up when the rapture happens. One spirit and this is God the Holy Spirit, and He is the one who is forming the body through the baptism of the Spirit. And He also fulfills a sevenfold ministry to every spiritual believer. Just as you were called in one hope, and that's hope encapsulated, the XYZ equation of your calling. One Lord, and that's Jesus Christ, and He is Lord of all. One faith. And that means there's only one way to get saved, pistis, 
and you are pistics. You are people of faith. One baptism, and that is the baptism of the Spirit. We're going to study baptism next. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And that's the first member of the Godhead, God the Father. So we have seven doctrines. They are the believer's heritage. Uh, if you were going to fly a banner, every one of these doctrines would be on the banner. And this would be your legacy or heritage that you would even pass on to the next generation. Okay, we started the doctrine of faith. And you're going to have to help me where we finished at. I know we made it through the definition. We made it through the Greek and the, the Hebrew and the Greek, I believe. So we started on the Greek and I think we took a look at the faith rest drill. Three stages or not? Yes. And then in, <clears throat> we took a look at the idea that pistis is objective what is believed. All right, and I think we're going to start on. Okay, Pitheo, Etho. So we're looking at Greek vocabulary terms that are translated faith. And in Genesis, I mean, excuse me, in Galatians 1.10, we see the verb patho. In the passive, it means to come to believe, to obey, or be persuaded or convinced. The perfect passive means to have confidence, to be absolutely convinced, to be certain. The active meaning in Galatians 1.10 means to convince, to persuade, or to appeal, to win over. The perfect tense with a present meaning means to depend on someone, to trust on someone, or to have confidence. The verb pistoo means to show oneself faithful, to be convinced, or to have confidence in 2 Timothy 3.14. So all of these come from the uh, root word pistis. You can see that uh, they're very similar. We're looking at the different forms of that word. Okay, now we start a new section in section C, the biblical use of the word faith or pistis. One of the most famous chapters on faith is Hebrews chapter 11. What a lot of people don't recognize, it, it, the word pistis is in the objective sense, is what is believed. It could be translated doctrine. And if you understand the word doctrine, it is teaching from the Bible. That's what doctrine means. Doctrine means teaching. Teaching that comes from the Scripture. So these people were believing the Scripture. They were believing the teaching that came from the Scripture. And that's what motivated their lives. So in that verse in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 3 it says in fact you read it it says faith doctrine is the reality 
from which we keep receiving confidence. See, that makes a lot of difference because teaching from the Scripture is a lot different than this faith. And so if you receive teaching from the Scripture, that, that's a totally different person than that is just someone believing. Because, <clears throat> I'll tell you, a lot of people can't stand to be taught. They don't want to. They don't want to sit in front of a pastor teacher with authority, and they don't want to be convinced that there's anybody that's uh, in some kind of authority position to teach. And this is the person who is a hippie in their mind. They resent and reject all authority in life except their own. See, their authority is the highest. And they are authority on life, see. And that, but, but they'll never tell you that. Their opinion is what their authority is. And that um, there can't be anybody who has a spiritual gift who could study the Word of God and teach it with any authority, except they miss out on Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 17. I'm going to read it to you. See, there has to be teaching from the Word of God for you to build your faith up. And in the church age, God has provided pastor teachers to study the Word of God in the original languages and teach it to you in an assembly. And so this verse tells you about this guy. It says in Hebrews 13, 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the Word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. That means they are held to a harsher standard of discipline. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls and those who, as those who must give account that means I'm going to answer for the gift that I was given when I stand before Bema. And I'm going to be held to a higher standard than you will. I'll be responsible for the mystery doctrine of the church age and having taught it. Must give account. L let them do so with joy and not with grief. Well, that would be unprofitable for you. So, <clears throat> you have the people of Hebrews chapter 11. And it says their lives represented the fact that they were believing the teaching from the Scripture. The trouble is somebody's got to teach it. So here we go. And it says, in fact, doctrine is the reality from which we keep receiving confidence. The proof of matters not being seen for by, means, for by means of doctrine, men of old gained approval. That means God's righteous standard was satiated because they had truth in their souls. We're studying one of those individuals now that's mentioned in verse 22. It says, By doctrine, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel, prophecy, and gave instructions concerning his bones. In other words, he provided in an entire nation a destiny by saying, don't you put me in the ground here. We're going to the promised land. You throw me in a box and carry me out of this place. Point two, as a description of faith is found in 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, we look not at the things which are seen, especially the news, but at the things which are not seen. That's the essence of God. For the things which are seen are temporal, this world but the things which are not seen are eternal. That means that the world around you is fake and it's fading away. 
And the thing that is coming is more real than anything you see around you. It wasn't too long ago that we looked at Jesus enthroned in heaven. And He is absolutely seated at the right hand of God the Father right now in the place of power and authority. And there are six winged angels singing right now, holy, 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 in heaven, in the throne room. And that is more real than anything you see here on earth. See, faith is what reveals it. Believing it. It makes it real in your mind. So faith is the means by which we perceive reality in the invisible essence of God. What's beautiful about this is the fact that the Scripture is what reveals God. And I'm so thankful for my Jewish friends the Bible was written by Jews. It was protected by Jews at great cost. And uh, the nation Israel, we owe a great debt of, of gratitude and our Jewish friends. And so without the Scripture, we couldn't, we couldn't know about God. Well, we could know He's wonderful by looking at creation, but we really wouldn't understand Him at all. Point three, sometimes both the faith rest technique and doctrine are described in the meaning of pistis. As in 2 Corinthians 5-7, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. This is a wonderful uh, time to claim this verse right now with all the things going on in the world. And um, I love the fact that the um, Old Testament is full of promises for the believer. And the Bible even says that even the Old Testament promises are even for you. It says they're given to you in Hebrews. So that's one of the things you can pull out of the Old Testament is the promises. And um, I love some of these because we're in a world with a, a deadly virus. And uh, it's, it's killing some people. But the Bible says that uh, nothing can touch you. And that if you did contract a virus and that you did even die from the virus, that it is in fact God's dying grace towards you. So that you can be totally relaxed about the situation. Can you understand that is God has determined the time, the manner, and the place of every believer's death? God has. That's dying grace. And that you had nothing to do with it. So it is our place to trust in His plan. Whether we are to live or whether we are to die, it is Christ, Paul says. So that if I'm walking in God's plan, there is no deadly virus in the world that can touch me until God says it's time, then I'm going to go home. It doesn't matter. I can walk through the fires of hell and nothing can touch me. David says, though a thousand fall around me and ten thousand by my side, nothing can touch me. See, he's on the field of battle. Job says, I am at league with the stones of the field. That means the ancient artillery. And so you see, the faith rest drill carries you through life and you trust in God's plan. We see the unseen through doctrine, the teaching of the Bible. Doctrine gives us relationship with the integrity of God which sustains us in time of disaster or famine. 
we see the justice and integrity of God through doctrine. In Hebrews 11.6 is point four. I love this translation. And you, all, you almost need to write it in your Bible because people have this so wrong. It says, most people quote it, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. But it should be translated doctrine. And without teaching from the Scripture, it is impossible to please God. Without doctrine resident in the soul, it's impossible to please God. For when one is occupied with God, he must be convinced that he is and that he becomes a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You seek God through the Scripture, and you learn it. And the best way to learn it is from a pastor who's qualified to teach it. And when you learn doctrine, you know what this verse says? God brings blessing down the grace pipeline to you. For doctrine creates capacity for blessing. Point five is Romans ten seventeen. Doctrine comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There is no building of faith without the Scripture. You can't go out in nature and worship God if you don't have any of the Scripture in your soul. Now, if you do have some Scripture in your soul, you can go out in nature and you can appreciate God. But you can't do it without truth. You'll end up worshiping the created and not the creator. The Bible says that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. You can't learn how to do that without the Scripture. Point six. Galatians 5.22 says... The fruit of the Spirit, one of those is faith or doctrine. So God the Holy Spirit promotes the fruit of the Spirit in the life of the spiritual believer. And one of those fruit is doctrine itself. Pistis, faith, doctrine. So point seven in each ver verse above that we've looked at, Pistis relates faith to the perception of Bible doctrine. Pistis means faith and doctrine. All perception of doctrine is accomplished through the function of faith perception. It's funny because <clears throat> before I got back into taping and going to church, I read my Bible. And I read it from cover to cover. And I started out reading the Bible and I told myself, I am going to understand this book. And I am going to believe it. But if you've ever read your Bible from cover to cover, you know it's filled with problems in the English. And it doesn't make any sense. And the first problem I ran into was the fact that I was reading about Adam in the, in the garden. And God said, God told Adam, if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. And I said, okay, I've got it. He can't eat that fruit. He's going to hit the ground dead as a hammer. And what happened? Adam, I, I, I keep reading, and then I see Adam ate the fruit. He didn't die. The Bible's not true. Shut the cover and go on with life. 
But there's seven different kinds of death in the Bible, and it wasn't until I listened to a qualified pastor teacher teach me the seven deaths of the Bible that I understood that Adam died. And not only that, he died the deepest death you can die, spiritual death. It says, dying thou shalt die. Doubled. He dug a hole, the, he put the whole human race into spiritual death, and it was a terrible death that he died. But I couldn't see it in the English. And I thought God was a liar, because I just read it in the English. And it wasn't until I had a qualified pastor teacher sit, and I sat down in humility, and I listened and I learned. Now, now I'm believing. And God makes sense. But see, if you're a hippie and you reject all authority in life, you'll never get it. You'll never get it. Faith perception. Bible reading's not enough. You've got to learn. So point eight, First Timothy one nineteen and four one use pistis for the doctrine of demons. And the doctrine of demons is circulating today. The doctrine of demons always takes the truth of the Bible and twists it. They love half-truths and partial truths. It's amazing what's happened to the United States we all know that if we, if we get enough believers in the pivot, we can turn this nation around. If we add some salt. See, our, our previous generation of super grace believers are dying off. All our good people are dying off, see. And we haven't replaced them. And that's why you've seen the decline of the United States. And that's why we'll never save it by a politician. We'll never save it by a politician. But if we add mature believers to that pivot... God will raise up a, a leader. He'll raise up men who adhere to the Constitution. He'll raise up a military force. He'll raise up people who vote conservative. But if, we, if the pivot keeps shrinking, none of those things will happen. There's how you save your nation. You grow up to spiritual maturity and you add yourself to the pivot. And do you know what, what the doctrine of demons is saying? If we follow all these conspiracies, these minor things that are happening out here, somehow we can save the nation. And we get, see, it's a total distraction to Bible class. See, you know what the answer is. Add yourself to the pivot by daily taking in Bible doctrine. Become a mature believer. That's the answer. But you're distracted from that by following some crazy conspiracy out here. While it may be true, it's not going to matter if you find it out if you haven't added yourself to the pivot. So hit play on that tape. That's the answer. So section D, faith is the means of salvation adjustment to the justice of God. When I, was grew, when I grew up, we had wonderful cartoons. And um, we always watched cartoons on Saturday morning. They came on TV. Man, we would adjust that antenna. Turn it a little bit more. Okay, right there. And my, we would sit down with a bowl of cereal and watch cartoons on Saturday morning. We got up early just so we could do it. And my brother could eat a whole box of cereal. Man, he could, he could wipe out the cereal cabinet. But um, also during holidays, there were special cartoons. And one of those was Charlie Brown. 
You know, I always watched Charlie Brown Christmas. He always came on. And it was a, it's a good cartoon. It was wholesome. And um, there was a character on the cartoon called Pigpen. And he, he was, he walked around and the, the artist drew little lines coming off of him, but it was supposed to be his smell. He smelled bad. He was dirty. It was like dust was flying off of him all the time. And you were going, well, man, I would stay away from that little dust area if I was around pig pen. But we have to recognize that every member of the human race is pig pen when we approach the righteousness of God. And we can never satiate God's righteousness except by one means, faith. He's given us one non-meritorious means of satiating His essence. And this is what this is about. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in His sight. We can't do anything that would appeal to God. The only thing He asks for unbelieving man to do is believe faith so point one believing is non-meritorious perception the merit is always found in the object of faith that's Jesus Christ and not the subject the one having the faith the believer see anybody can have faith the good the bad the rich the poor the great the small the person who just rolled out of the ditch as a drunkard in the morning, the President of the United States can have faith. It's all the same. It's non-meritorious. you got a lot of passages. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, there's 153 passages which explain that salvation comes by faith alone in Christ alone. And here's just a few of them. I've covered quite a few of these with you before. Acts 16.31 is famous. John 3.16. John 3.18 and 19.36. John 6.47. John 20.31. I love Romans chapter 3, verses 22, also 26 and 28. Romans 4, 5, Romans 9, 30, Galatians 2, 16, Galatians 3, 26, 1 John 3, 23, 1 John 5, 4 through 5. We are pistics here. We believe in salvation by faith alone and Christ alone. Now, Nine out of ten churches do not believe this, and they believe you have to do something to get saved other than believe, whether it's walk the aisle and stand in front of the congregation and be accepted by the congregation and show that you believe, or maybe something else. They, uh, the Pentecostals don't believe you're saved if you haven't spoken in tongues. They call it the baptism of the Spirit. It's completely false. The assembly of God believe that you uh, have a second blessing after salvation called a tongues experience, which you show that you've been saved. All tongues ceased in 70 AD, by the way. It was a sign to unbelieving Israel of the impending doom that was coming. Even in some of the uh, legalistic Baptist churches, they say, well, if you don't have enough faith to walk the aisle, you probably weren't saved. But maybe you're just shy, see? Salvation happens in the pew right where you believed at. And it's not by walking the aisle. And I was extremely shy and embarrassed to walk down the aisle as a young man in a Baptist church. with everyone. See, everyone's going to look at you. When you come out the aisle, every pit is going to turn around to see and you know what the Baptists say I want to see somebody get saved 
See, the whole movement is based on a falsehood. And G Jesus tells Nicodemus, He says, it's like the wind. You, never, you don't see where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with regeneration and the Spirit being born again. You can't see somebody get saved. It happens invisibly. So nine out of ten churches believe that you must do something in some form of works, whether you have to jump through a psychological hoop and feel sorry for your sins and maybe come down to the altar and cry tears of repentance. Maybe you have to ask forgiveness or be baptized or join the church. See, all of these are human works of some form or another. Faith is the only method of salvation and the Bible proclaims it in 153 verses in the New Testament. And therefore, you can't go through a list, a checklist. You can't have the ABCs of salvation. It's believing. Faith. And anybody can do it. Anybody. Point three, the mechanics of receiving all blessing from the justice of God is grace, whether it's salvation blessings or post-salvation blessing. Grace is non-meritorious and compatible with faith. We studied that in Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Pistis. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We keep on living a life of faith after salvation, though. And what's amazing is, is the fact that the very method by which we got saved, believing, is the same method by which we advance as believers. Believing. Faith. Doctrine is what builds faith after salvation. It's just like me reading my Bible. My faith was destroyed when I read it in the English. When I studied it under a qualified pastor, it went the other direction. See, my faith went down when I read it in the English. And when I finally learned the truth, my faith went through the ceiling. Faith is the method that God uses at salvation and even after. So point E, faith is a system of doctrine or what is believed. What's in your soul? So the object of faith is the teaching of the Bible. This includes both doctrine and perception and application. So you gather up a lot of truth, but one day you get to apply it. Bible doctrine is invisible. Faith is confidence in the unseen. Bible doctrine must be transferred to your right lobe by means of faith. So you can keep Bible knowledge as gnosis, the Bible calls it. Wisdom. Or you can believe it and it becomes epinosis, full knowledge. That's when it's in your right lobe. Point two, the perception concept is related to post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. That means getting your head screwed on straight. The application concept is related to the faith rest drill or reverse concentration.
See, there's a problem we can't solve in America. We need to string up probably a thousand politicians right now. But nobody has the power to do it. Our police forces are corrupt. How are they going to do it? The highest police force in the nation, it seems like, is in on the conspiracy to destroy American freedom. How will they ever have the public gallows, tarred and feathered politicians hanging in the street? It'll never happen. But see, if we're believing what Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt. The preservative. We have our application. Now, which one is more frustrating? Seeing your country going down the tubes and wanting to uh, go out in the streets and do whatever it is, whether it's violence or march or shout, which will come to Noah do, or sit in your nice air-conditioned home and hit play on a Bible tape one hour a day and relax. Say, I'm growing up spiritually and I want to be part of the solution and not the problem. You see, that's the, God, that's the life God has planned for you. It's wonderful. Point three, once you have Bible doctrine on the launching pad, that means you're ready to apply it, of your soul, then the faith rest drill is in its maximum use applies doctrine to experience. It's wonderful. Now you can trust God. Every situation that you have no control over, guess what you do? You give it to God. You trust in Him. It's thorough, thoroughly relaxing. You're no longer tied up emotionally and psychologically. And you can relax in life. Point four, maturity adjustment to the justice of God demands maximum doctrine in the right lobe, which comes through daily perception, metabolization, and application. And that's where we need to be at. <clears throat> Until we reach maturity, we have a lot of problems in life. And the main problem of immaturity is distractions. We become distracted in life fairly easy in immaturity. And uh, we wander off pretty easy. In spiritual maturity... There is no distraction because you realize that Bible doctrine is the source of all blessing in life and nothing would take you away from that. It's just like uh, these Bible classes that I teach twice a week. You couldn't keep me away from here. I leave out early enough in the morning that if I break down somewhere along the way, I can take off my jacket and I can jog here and get here still in time to teach. You couldn't keep me out of this place. You know why? Because this is the place of blessing. See, Bible doctrine is how God makes love to us. The Scripture is God's love letter to every believer. And why would you want to skip out on a romance between God and you? It's the most wonderful thing you've ever had in your entire life. And therefore, in maturity... Distractions don't happen. You don't get carried away. But in immaturity, every distraction seems to carry you away. So point five, the intake of Bible doctrine results in maximum blessing in your soul. 
Blessing does not come because of your own self-righteousness or your personality, good works, or anything else. You become like David and your cup overflows. And you look up and you say, God, why me? But the truth is, anybody can have that blessing. Okay, we're going to take a break right there and we'll come back <clears throat> after, in about five minutes. Under the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We're looking at the word of truth. One word, pistis, faith. Starting a new section. The object of faith. Point one, the object of faith always has the merit. There's no merit in the subject because, the faith, because faith is a non-meritorious system. Of perception. Unlike rationalism and empiricism, you, if you want to be a big, big time rational thinker, you've got to have a great mind. And you've got to be able to bring a lot of concepts in and balance them and uh, weigh them against one another. In empiricism, you've got to be a great experimenter and a great tinkerer. And uh, really, what empiricism is 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 uh, is the idea that keep going till you find something. And a lot of people who who refuse to quit came up with some wonderful inventions and ideas and medicines and uh, fixes and you got to have a great mind not only that you got to have the the never quit attitude don't quit till you find it so it requires uh, merit to be a rational thinker or a great mind it requires merit to be a scientist or a tinkerer or experimenter But to learn by faith, it takes no merit. Anybody can do it. There is, it's a wonderful system that God uses. All the faith in the world secures nothing but condemnation from the integrity of God. We're born with faith. We must first learn vocabulary by faith. So... <clears throat> I hate it when public speakers get up and they pray to God. You might as well be praying to Allah. You might as well pray to Satan. Because the scripture tells us to address our prayers to God the Father in Jesus' name. Precisely. And if we're praying to the God of the Bible who created the universe, we'll do it. So what this point is telling us is all the faith in the world means nothing if it doesn't have the correct object. You can have all the faith in the world and go straight to hell. And you'll lead people there by praying to God. It could be you could be losing the lowercase g when you pray, and not the uppercase g. You have to be so arrogant not to follow the scriptures. Are we so high and mighty that we can't follow directions? You follow street signs, and the Bible tells us how to pray, and it's very easy. 
You pray to God the Father because He is the designer, the blueprinter of the ages. He invented the protocol plan of God. And you pray in Jesus' name because He is the executor of salvation. He completed the work of salvation on the cross. And not only that, pioneered the Christian way of life. Point three, however, the tiniest bit of faith in Christ secures eternal salvation. See, that's the mustard seed. It takes a little more faith than none at all. It's the object of faith that counts. Not the worthiness of the one with faith. The Bible says that when even one sinner repenteth, that means changes his mind about Christ, the angels in heaven rejoice. So that means that everyone that believes is causing millions of angels in heaven to have a party. And that means that we're one day closer to the rapture. One day closer to Satan being bound and thrown into the bottomless pit. One day closer to the eternal lake of fire and the separation of all creation. Though there is no merit in believing, the merit lies in the object of faith. And that's why the thief on the cross says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Kurios. When he called him Kurios, he recognized he was God. So there is a thief dying. He's never, see, he's, he's not joined the church. He's not been baptized. He's not done any good works that we know of. As a matter of fact, he's done some bad works to get up there. And he says, Lord. He recognized Jesus as the Christ. Remember me when you're coming to your kingdom. And Jesus responded. He said, no, you hadn't joined the church. No, you hadn't been baptized. No, you haven't done any good works. He said, surely today you shall be with me in paradise. Faith. See, the thief didn't have any merit. He's proven that he doesn't have any merit. He's nailed to a cross. He's the scum of society. The worst thing ever. A criminal. The merit was in the one hanging next to him, Jesus Christ. So point five, for salvation adjustment to the justice of God, the object of faith is Jesus Christ, His person and His work. But we can bring something else into this. For maturity adjustment to the justice of God, the object of faith is Bible doctrine. See, God didn't snatch you into heaven the moment you believed. He left you on earth for a purpose. And that purpose was to grow you up by means of doctrine. Point six, faith is not something we do, but it is the channel by which we appropriate what God has done for us.
the life of faith is beautiful because once you begin to grow up and you get a little doctrine, you'll recognize that every day is a gift. Being able to get out of the bed on your own power is grace extended to you. You couldn't do one thing without the grace of God. The food that's in your belly, the strength that's in your muscles, the sunshine on your face, the rain from the sky. All of these things are products of the grace of God. And the grace of God is sustaining us in ways you couldn't imagine. The very timbers in this building were once a tree standing in the forest that God watered and He knew that you'd need a place in the shade to sit and learn the Word of God and the grace right here. And these boards for you to have Bible class under. So maturity is by grace and it's simply us learning where God has sowed in eternity past and we are reaping daily. Point seven for rebound adjustment to the justice of God. The object of faith is twofold depending on the believer's spiritual growth. So after salvation, God has called us to be priests. Believer priests. And in the priesthood, we're supposed to operate clean. And rebound is the means of operating clean from your priesthood. It's a little bit difficult for new believers because it's invisible. And it doesn't make sense to a new believer. But if you recognize that Lucifer had a priesthood in eternity past, as you grow up, see, you'll learn the purpose of mankind is to resolve the angelic conflict. We're, we're a secondary creation. We're latecomers on the scene, if you will. You'll learn before time memoriam there was an angel, a very high angel named Lucifer. And every precious stone was his covering. He had a priestly ephod. But he rejected the priesthood that God had given him and eventually revolted against God's authority. So that in time, God has given every believer a priesthood and when that believer fulfills his priesthood, he can point, God can point over to you and he can say, Now look, Satan, that little man down there is accepting the priesthood I've given him and he's operating in it and I haven't convinced him of anything. He can't even see me. Now, why is it that he can do it and you couldn't have? See, that's you. You're either accepting or rejecting your priesthood. You're either providing evidence for the prosecution in the appeal phase of Satan's trial, or you're not. Now here we're looking at the fact that the immature believer is going to have the Scripture to convince him that he needs to operate clean from his priesthood. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, Jesus taught the foot washing. And He related it to the Old Testament bronze labor. In John, chapter 15, He says, You are clean from the words I have spoken to you. In John 13, Abide in Me. Remain clean. In 1 John 1 9, I quoted every Sunday before we start Bible class.
and other verses. 1 Corinthians 11, 31, Psalm 35, Psalm 32, 5, Psalms 38, 18, Proverbs 28, 13. And this is the truth that flows throughout the Bible. It's provided in Scripture. But there's also the mature believer Doctrine is the object of faith. And the integrity of God is the basis for understanding the forgiveness of our sins through rebound. So the mature believer can recognize when he sins, he keeps a short list with God. When he confesses those sins to God the Father in Jesus' name, he is in fact returning to the courtroom scene of the cross where God the Father judged his sins in Christ's body on the wood. That means you never outrun the cross. See, we, we appeal to the cross daily, even as born-again believers. So the immature believer sees 1 John 1, 9 as a free ticket to sin. The mature believer recognizes the payment, the, the heaviness of the debt that was settled. You see. You, you recognize that for every infraction, there must be a payment. That's the way God works. And Jesus paid the payment upon the cross in three hours. So point eight, through these adjustments to the justice of God and blessings from the integrity of God, Jesus becomes the author and the finisher of our faith in Hebrews 12.2. I was hoping to finish this today, so those of you who are taking notes, I know you're in the end, but we'll see if we can't get close. I'm not sure if I can make it or not. What about the application of faith and the function of the faith rest drill? I tell you, it's difficult, especially if you're in the middle of a, an emergency. You tend to concentrate on the problem and not the solution. So the faith rest drill is concentration on the solution. The point one, faith must be exercised as it develops. Learning doctrine develops faith. As this occurs, Faith has the increasing ability of perception, of learning, more and greater details of the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, the more doctrine you know, the more you can know. And you've got to start somewhere. And you start with basic doctrines. It doesn't mean they're easy. And you build Point two, God has a blessing which will only be yours if you relate totally to the integrity of God by learning doctrine in 1 Peter chapter 1, 7 and 8. He says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, 
may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Point three, Bible doctrine is the royal family's currency. I love this because the dollar in your pocket is shrinking. <clears throat> the government's spending more money than it ever has, and that means inflation, and that means that your dollar is worth less. Have you ever seen those people down in South America hauling a whole wheelbarrow full of money to buy a chicken? That's what happened to your dollar. Inflation never affects the value of Bible doctrine. It's the most steady form of currency known to man. It is the gold of the spiritual life. And you haul it around with you in your soul, not in a wheelbarrow. Point four, Abraham's circumcision is the classical illustration of the mature believer with maximum adjustist, adjustment to the justice of God, making application of his faith. It's found in Romans chapter 4, verses 17 to 21. Another instance is Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac was the proof or testing of his mature faith. When you read and when you learn the story of Abraham, the life of Abraham, you find out Abraham didn't start out as a mature believer. He had a lot of distractions and a lot of hiccups. And um, you'll find out down at the towards the end of his life when God asked him to sacrifice his son, he did not hesitate knowing that God could raise him from the dead, it says. Of course, God stopped him. And it was proof of his mature faith. Well, I've run out of time and I'm not going to be able to cover the whole thing. We'll stop right there. We're studying the doctrine of faith. And it takes a lot of faith to live in this world that we're in today. Because the world's going haywire, y'all. It is absolutely gone haywire. But we're not to ride the roller coaster. Don't do it. We have something that's steady. And that's Jesus Christ enthroned at the right hand of God. And we have His Word. And therefore, we don't have to go through all the turmoils that the rest of the world is going through. We can be solid in our faith, steady as the sun coming up. Okay, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this morning.